Today's presenter is Michelle Heading. Michelle is the Spiritual Care Coordinator at Washington Hospital. She received her master's degree in spirituality and culture from the Sophia Center at Holy Names University. She is a registered nurse with her master's in nursing. Michelle is also a certified hospice and palliative care nurse. The topic tonight in the final of the caregiver series is in some ways when Lucy first told me about the topic I thought well this is ahead of time if we're caregiving you know we aren't at this stage yet but it's good to plan ahead so that's how I'm looking at this is that this is information and some may have had losses already in their life so it's, it's just good information to have. Tonight what we're going to do is talk about first some definitions talk about the stages of grief. We'll talk about the signs and symptoms of grief, types of help that's available for those that are grieving, when it's a good idea to seek professional help, some common myths about grief. There's a lot of myths about grief, so I'll dispel a few of those tonight. And then, as I said, there'll be lots of time for questions and answers. So as far as definitions, loss can be related to a person, place, thing, relationship, any situation that there is a change. Usually we think of loss as a person that has passed, but sometimes it's, it's actually a change in a job, it may be a move, um, it may be something that, that is not, not a person necessarily. So that's something to consider is that grief can encompass more than just people. And grief is that emotional response to the loss. So that's what you feel in response to, to losing someone or something. Mourning is that outward social expression of your grief. Often it's very influenced by culture. Different cultures will grieve in different ways, some more openly, some more privately. Um, but mourning is that outward expression of your grief. And bereavement includes both the grieving and the mourning. So, so th those are just some basic definitions before we get into the talk. And I already covered some of this. Some types of loss include uh, an actual person or a pet. Sometimes people don't think about that, but a pet is a death, a loss. New changes in work, layoffs, new jobs, that kind of thing is a loss. Um, divorce, separation, moving, kids moving away, the empty nest syndrome, right? When kids move away, that's, that's a change, right? Something is different, you're losing something. And then health changes. As you're working with folks or you're caring for people in your life and they're having different health issues, um, they're losing a level of independence that they were used to. So that, that's a loss too. So it cuts across a lot of different categories. There's talk of the stages of grief, and the one thing I want to say to begin with is that that is never intended to be an actual linear stage. This is, this is a linear chart that talks about the classic stages of grief. Um, in 69, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote the book on death and dying. It's considered to be sort of the gold standard for grief. She talked about denial, bargaining, depression, anger, and acceptance. It doesn't happen in a certain order you can sometimes stay stuck in one place. You might stay stuck in anger. You might go right to acceptance. You never know. And you might get to acceptance and find your way back to denial or anger. It's, it's more of a circular um, path than it is a linear path. So this is more what grief looks like. It's not a straight line. It's not linear. It's not like a checklist. It's all over the place. I often talk about not only is it a roller coaster, it's a long roller coaster, and you've never been on that roller coaster before. You have no idea where the turn's going to be. It's not your favorite one at Santa Cruz Boardwalk that you know it's going to turn this way, it's going to turn that way. This one is a mystery. You don't know where you're headed. Um, so what you do is you buckle in and, and you, you take the ride and you get help. So Gordon's Four Tasks of Grieving talk about accepting the reality of the loss. That's an important part of any process of grieving is to just accept that this has happened. To work through the pain of grief. So it's not a matter of getting around or under. It's, it's finding your way through it. Adjusting to the world without your, the deceased person or the relationship or the job fill in the blank of the loss adjusting to this new normal. Nothing is as it was, so you're adjusting 
to the world without the, the person, place, or thing that you've lost. And then finding an enduring connection with the deceased in the midst of finding that new path. I facilitate our grief support group on Thursday nights and people will talk about ways that they feel they've been visited by their loved one. Um, someone associates butterflies with, with visits from, from their loved one. I personally have suffered grief in my life and I get visited by hummingbirds um, to remind me of my dad. So sometimes it's more, more obvious than others. Some people receive dreams, um, but, but in, any, in any way, when you're, when you're working through grief, you want to find that way to keep a connection because that person that you lost, even that job, whatever it is that you lost, if you keep that connection going, then, then you're going to find a way through. So sometimes you only think of the actual loss where you lose something and, and you move on. There are actually lots of different types of grief, um, so I want to go into that a little bit. Anticipatory grief is when you can see down the road that some grief is coming your way, and you don't know when, you don't know how, but you know that it's coming. And so you're already starting to feel some of those stages of grief. You might be in denial. Nope, they're not, they're not going to go. It's, it's not going to happen. You might be really angry. Why do they have this illness, you know? So anticipatory grief is a real thing. And it's important to recognize that because the way that you handle your anticipatory grief will really show up a lot in how you handle the actual loss when it does come. So if you acknowledge it and find people in your life that will acknowledge it with you, that's an important step in, in the grieving process that people often don't think about because it's before the loss happens uncomplicated and I put normal in quotes because there really isn't a normal grief but um, there is uncomplicated grief and everyone has a different a different path through grief I often talk about grief your grief journey being as unique as your thumbprint we all have a different one so even if you're grieving the same person your path to grief may be different it's very very um, dependent on who you are, what your personal makeup is, so your personality, how you cope with things, um, your life experience, you know, people that have experienced a lot of loss, it doesn't necessarily mean you're an expert at dealing with loss, but you probably have some coping skills that someone who's never experienced loss doesn't have. Your faith, a lot of times I talk to people and, you know, if it's an unexpected death, if it's a tragic death, if it's a death of a young person, their faith often is all that gets them up out of bed in the morning. So, so that's something to, to hang on to if that's part of your, your life. And then the nature of the loss. Again, I talked about if it's sudden, tragic, that may be, you may have a different experience of grief than if it's something that's been over time and you know, you've been having some anticipatory grief, you've gotten support. It may be a different, um, a different experience. And the thing to acknowledge is that grieving takes time. Um, it's not a task. Again, it's not a checklist. It's not something that you, know, you have a time limit. Um, it, it takes as long as it takes. So complicated grief would be when the pain of the loss or grief is so constant or severe that it really keeps you from doing your life. It disrupts you in a way that doesn't allow you to get up and get out of bed. Sometimes people would use words like intense, intrusive, extreme. You might be feeling bitterness. It goes beyond the, the, the stages of grief that I talked about to a more extreme place. Um, that, that might be a sign, and we'll talk more about other details. That might be a sign that you need to get some support, some help. And we'll talk about the different ways you can do that. Disenfranchised grief is a grief that people usually don't either know about or don't talk about. Um, it's when your heart is grieving but you can't share about it. Either because someone feels that your grief is unacceptable, that maybe it, they, people don't think it's a real grief because it's, it's a job or it's a divorce or a pet. Sometimes if a relationship isn't recognized by society, whether it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, close friends that, that are, are lost, sometimes people don't give you the space to have grief for that. And it's just as valid as if your mom dies or if your brother dies. Um, and 
often in healthcare, um, healthcare professionals, it's it's our job, but we also are human. So sometimes if you're in the healthcare profession, you don't always get the space to feel your feelings about the losses. Stigmatized deaths. If someone dies of something like AIDS or violence or suicide, drug overdoses, sometimes you know, people go to a place that, that isn't very supportive. Um, so that disenfranchised grief, I think, needs a little bit of extra holding, either in a support group setting or, or with some, some individual help, because you need someone that's going to get it, someone that's going to understand what you're going through and is going to validate that your grief is just as real as, as anything else. So that's disenfranchised grief children's grief books that are recommended and some of them I've actually used. My, um, my Nana died in 2001 and so my niece and nephew were like three and, and one at that time and before I was even a nurse um, I had gone to the library and librarians rock. They, they gave me um, The Fall of Freddie the Leaf and it, it's an incredible book. I love this book. It talks about the seasons of a tree and, and you know it's all bright and cheery in the spring and by the winter all the leaves are falling off and it, it brings it to a level that kids can understand. Kids' grief is normal and it's real. The most important thing that I can tell you is that you don't want to use euphemisms like they're asleep because if you say that, then every time someone they love goes to sleep, they're going to think that they might not see them again. So honesty is the best way to talk to kids. A lot of times, the experience of grief at a young age can help to sort of have that child grow emotionally in ways that they wouldn't have if it's handled well, if, if they're um, given, given the support that they need. Um, I had already said that I get visited by a hummingbird. I lost my dad when I was 13. So I, I have this direct experience and I feel that it actually informs the work that I do now. So, so don't shy away from being honest and really being present with kids because I got to tell you, they take in a lot more than we give them credit for. I have four-year-old grandkids, and they hear things that, that I think they're not listening, but they're listening. So even at that young of an age, be honest and be present with them. It's, it's an important example to set for them, I think. So some reactions to grief. I mean, obviously, you think immediately, well, sadness, you know, that's a feeling. But there's a lot more than that. Um, you can have physical symptoms of grief. You can have a tightness that you feel. Um, you can have the emotional feelings. Uh, you can have thoughts that, you know, continue to get in your head. Maybe the circumstances of the death, you can't sort of shake that thought, right? And behavioral changes, you know, you might not go certain places that you used to go. So there's, there's a lot of different realms that grief can touch. So, so knowing that helps to sort of normalize it. Um, again, the grief support group that I facilitate, we talk about these things and people come in that are new in their grief and they say, I'm doing X, Y, Z. Is that weird? And we're like, no, that's normal. You know, what you're feeling is is normal for you. It's um, it's it's going to be different no matter what. Remember our thumbprint. It's different as our thumbprint. So types of support. Um, the group that I've referenced a couple times is one type of support. Drop-in bereavement groups are a great way to find community around the loss that you've had. Everyone's going to have a different story. Some may be similar. Some may be very different. But the commonality will be that you've all experienced a, a loss um, and are grieving. Structured support for grief can sometimes be in the form of a class. Some local hospices offer, usually free of charge, um, a class. So it might be like an eight-week curriculum where they go through a lot of lessons. Our group is more of a peer support group, so people show up and share at the level they're comfortable. Sometimes structured support can be really helpful in the beginning, so it'll give you some tools and, and some ways to handle um, what you're feeling. Family and friends. You're going to know who's going to be comfortable with being with you in your grief, and you're going to know who isn't comfortable. And you're going to choose the people that, that can walk with you um, to share from your heart about what you're feeling. 
a lot of times people, well-meaning people, will say things to you when you're grieving that, that aren't that helpful. Um, they don't do it with malice. They do it because they might not know what to say. Again, we talked about some people have a lot of experience with grief. Those that don't can be very uncomfortable with grief. Um, so they, they may not be the ones that you go to, but family and friends can be incredible support when you're in that process. There's a lot online, I found. Um, as, as I started doing this group four years ago, there's groups on Facebook, there's different blogs. There's one that I really, really love. It's called What's Your Grief? And the co-authors of this blog are all people who have personally experienced grief. They're professional, so it's, it's like legitimate information. And it just says it so real. It just puts it out there. Sometimes I will print stuff off from that to bring to the group because it just, it cuts to the chase and says it like it is. Um, not, not in a rude way, but just in a, in a really refreshing sort of way. We talked about faith. If you have a faith tradition, um, you can always go and talk to your pastor your priest, whoever you feel connected to, that will just be there and be present with you and hold, hold the space with you, really. That, that's what, what you need, is just to have someone to witness what you're going through. If it gets to the point where you feel like it's more than, than those things can help, um, seeking some professional counseling in a one-on-one -on -one setting can be really useful. Um, the County of Alameda has some resources. Through the, um, the crisis support line, if you Google that, you'll find it. They have grief counselors that are available, usually on a sliding scale. And often you don't need a lot of sessions. You just need someone to sort of help you through some of those harder points. If you feel like you're more towards that complicated grief that I talked about, that might make sense. And often just a combination of, of the above is, is what's called for. Follow your heart and your intuition, because you really know best. You know what was going to help you. So we've talked some about this, but a time when you might think about seeking more help than, than just the group kind of help that I'm talking about. If you're feeling like life isn't worth living, wishing that um, you had died with your loved one, if it's, if it's getting like further than just sadness, um, if you're blaming yourself, feeling numb or disconnected for more than a short period of time, expressing difficulty trusting others, having that inability to um, perform your daily activities, if you just feel like you're sort of checking out for longer than, than a short period of time. Um, and then again, as I said, trust your intuition. If you feel like this is bigger than I can handle by myself, then it would probably make sense for you to seek a little bit of extra support. Okay, so I promised myths and facts about grief. The myth would be that the pain will go way faster if you ignore it. Does that sound like it makes sense? I don't think so. Trying to ignore your pain or keep it from surfacing will actually make it worse in the long run. For real healing, it's necessary for you to face your grief and to deal with it. It doesn't go away. Denial is, is temporarily a coping skill, but just putting it away, um, it'll come up at some point. Actually, it makes me think of someone that, that came once to the grief group who um, came to support a friend, and it turned out being there, she realized she had some stuff she hadn't worked through. So it'll come back. Um, so, so deal with it as soon as you can. It's important to be strong in the face of loss. What does strong even mean? I mean, strong can look a lot of different ways. Feeling sad, frightened, or lonely is normal, and it's not weak. I'll, I'll say that. It's not weak. Crying doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't, you don't need to protect your family from your tears. Showing your true feelings actually sometimes can help others that are grieving because you're just being real. You're, you're really experiencing what you're experiencing. And don't be worried if you don't cry, because that doesn't mean that you're not missing the person. Everyone grieves differently. So, you know, feel the feelings that you're feeling. And that's the next myth. If you don't cry, it means you're not sorry for the loss. It's a normal reaction to sadness, but it's definitely not the only, the only way. Everyone has a different way of showing it. I remember someone once said to me that people that don't cry after grief, their tears are just taking a different route. They're just going inside. They're not, they're, you know, so think of it however you need to think about it, but your way of grieving is okay. It, it doesn't have to look a certain way. 
and my favorite myth is that grief should last about a year. When the calendar clicks a year, it should just be over. Yeah. No. There is absolutely no right or wrong time frame for grieving. It takes as long as it takes. Um, and again, I would say that if it's taking a long time and you're not leaving the house and you're keeping the covers over your head, that's complicated grief. That's not like a normal grief that's taking as long as it needs to take. But you know, if you're on that roller coaster and you're having some days where you're like, wow, this is hard. I just heard a song that reminded me of my dad. I, I'm having a hard day today. And then tomorrow, you're going along and you're fine and a hummingbird comes by and everything's okay, you know? So just know that you're gonna ride that roller coaster and, and that's okay. Um, but there is not a time limit, absolutely not a time limit. So this is a quote that I found from Rose Kennedy, who we know dealt with a lot of loss in her life. It has been said, time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain. In time, the mind, protecting its sanity, covers them with scar tissue, and the pain lessens. But it is never gone. And that just really reflected for me the truth about grief. And these were a couple other images and, and sayings that I found. Um, I often find things like this can help me to connect, and I know it helps the grief group to connect. The capacity to grieve is as much a part of us as the capacity to love. And I tell folks in my group, we grieve as deeply as we love. So if we didn't love, we probably wouldn't grieve. So they're, they're going to be at the same level. And then I found an image that actually said what I've always said about grief. Each person's grief journey is as unique as a fingerprint or a snowflake. We don't see many snowflakes around here, um, but you know what they are. <laughs> and um, Queen Elizabeth, grief is the price that we pay for love. They don't exist outside of each other. Um, they, they're very connected. I appreciate you guys coming out tonight for this talk. Grief is a hard topic, but, but it's an important one for us to, to face together. So thank you guys for being here.